have instructed me. I pray, Father, for ears that have an ability to hear and receive, that we might be blessed and built up, Lord, today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know. Am I on? I've got a green light of some sorts. Yeah? You try it now? Keep, keep going. All right. Okay. I'll keep going. We'll see what happens. Uh, apparently, for those who are on YouTube, I'm going to catch you up on a few things. Apparently, Rick said earlier that he's not going to be preaching for a while. I don't know if that means I'm going to be up here again. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no it's not currently on the schedule, but Rick's shaking his head yes. But uh, our current plans are to leave here on February 21st, a lot longer than what we had anticipated. But we are thankful that we see the Lord at work, and we know that we are exactly where we need to be. It wasn't where we wanted to be, but we're where we need to be. And if you're where you need to be, then there's no place better to be. Um, so there we are. Here we are. Um, I also want to clean up uh, something. Um, not that Victor did anything wrong. I, I'm so thankful for Victor's testimony. It was beautiful. But I want to clarify something. And I, I'll, tell, I'll go ahead and tell this, the full story for those who are just joining on YouTube because I know they cut the, the sermon just to uh, the beginning. Uh, but was it Thursday night? Thursday night. Uh, I pick up Vika and bring her home. I think she had had a time of prayer. Uh, not prayer, uh, Bible study with Kayla and some others and Emily, and so thankful for that. We're bringing her home, and as we're getting right close to our house, I mean, we, we're blocked literally by fire trucks and police cars, and they have three full of the, of the larger full-size fire trucks and multiple, multiple police cars. And every direction to our house is almost blocked, and so we have to go all the way around. And I go in, and I say, did y'all see what's going on outside down the street? And they're like, no, what's happening? I said, there's police cars everywhere. It's like lit up blue and red lights. So we do what every self-respecting neighbor would do. We go out to see what all the fuss is about. And the kids come, and as we're coming, all the neighbors are coming, and we come and look, and we stand, and we're like, wow, there was a fire just six houses down from us. About, seems like six. And um, I got to be honest with you, because you all know some of the story already. But I did the same thing as the rest of the neighbors did. The rest of the neighbors came up and they looked and they said, wow, that's really horrible. I hope they figure it out. All right, let's go home. <laughs> and uh, I kind of did the same thing. I was like, OK. The firemen are here taking care of doing their business. Uh, kids, let's go home and uh, let's go back. But not my wife. My wife has a gifting and a compassion that exceeds many other people that I've seen. And she weaves her way through the police officers and the fire trucks and firemen. And uh, she starts talking to the 13-year-old son, finds out that this, uh, I don't want to say elderly, they're in their 50s, but this woman who is a full-time caregiver of this husband who is, has uh, stage four cancer and is bedridden, has been drugged from their home that was on fire, and is now sitting in a wheelchair up front. And my wife continues to say, what's needed? What can we do for you? We have this. We have cars. We have food. We have a place for you to stay. And even when they were overwhelmed and couldn't even respond to, to everything, she stayed because she knew that there was going to be a need. And she stayed consistently until they finally look around and go, we don't have a place to stay. Can we come home to you, with you to your house? Are you sure? And the reason why I wanted to say this, because many people know that we have these guests in our home right now. And uh, I don't get any of that credit. <laughs> it's not any, because of anything that I did, but it's because my wife has compassion. She hates a center, being a center of attention, so don't draw attention to her. Um, but I am very... <laughs> Cody, come up here. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm very thankful for my wife. This is what she does in Latvia. She uses her powerful giftings. I don't even think she knows that it's a gift, but she serves in this way, and it's very beautiful, and I'm blessed to be a part of it. So kids, if, 
Victor, Rachel, Will, Vika, Abby. Don't think that your father had anything to do with this. This is your mother. Um, I want to share with you today from, uh, we're going to start off in 2 Kings chapter 5. We're going to talk about humility and pride, what that looks like. And I'm not going to read to you, but it is good for you to have in front of you. I've preached from about Naaman before. And many of you might be familiar with the story. Starting in verse 1. It says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now I'm going to, tell, I'm going to paraphrase the, the rest of the story. But it says he had much favor in the eyes of his master. In other words, when you're the commander of the army, the, pretty much the only person that's over you is the king. And the story is that this king obviously knows that Naaman is a leper. And if you don't know anything about leper, leper leprosy is this consuming skin disease that basically uh, you basically go numb and you lose the abilities to even feel your parts of your body and you slow your extremi extremities die and wither away and fade away and rot. It's a horrible way to die. And when you have leprosy, it is contagious, so you're, you're separated from all your people. You're separated from those you love. You're separated from, from those that you want to be with. I'm sure he was even separated from his other uh, military commanders that he needed to be with. And the king knew this. It's, it's probably the first social distancing you've seen, uh, or at least the original social distancing. But the king knows this. And a young woman says, oh, if only Naaman was able to go to the prophet that is in Israel. So what does the king do? The king writes a letter, sends Naaman with gifts to Israel, to the king, and says, hey, heal my servant. He's got leprosy. Fix him. And the king is like, this guy's trying to pick a fight with me. How am I? Can I heal? Can I do this? But it is quickly brought to his atten attention that Elisha is a prophet and says, bring him to me. Naaman makes his way, long story short, Naaman comes out to Elisha. Elisha sends a servant out and says, go, bathe yourself seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be healed. And of course, Naaman has expectations. Naaman has been traveling for days, and he's like, probably has an idea. I'm going to see a prophet of God that's going to give me healing. I know exactly, or got an idea about how this is go. And you probably all imagine, go, it's going to be like some kind of waving of hands and putting his hands and calling on the Lord and saying, heal this man, do something. But he comes out and says, no, go bathe seven times, and you'll be healed. And Naaman is put out by this. He's like really like disappointed that this is not going according. And he turns around to go home because this is not going how he thought it was supposed to go. Until finally his own servant says, hey, wait a second. Before we go home, shouldn't we at least like, this is a good word that the prophet has given you. It ends in healing. Shouldn't we at least try what the prophet has said? And among things that the, uh, the name is saying, don't we have rivers in Syria that, that are better than the Jordan? Can't I go bathe in those? Be like, try it. Go, see, test. So he goes and he dips himself. He bathes seven times in the Jordan. And it says that his skin comes out like a baby. <laughs> like baby skin. I can't remember what it said. Like, a, like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Now the story goes on about Naaman. But I, what I want to talk to you about in this verse is this idea of such pride that is kept on by expectations, by ideas, by agendas. And it's prevalent not only in Naaman and his time, but here in our church, in us, we have expectations about how things should go. And I'm going to just right now just label that pride. 
We have ideas how everything should go. Our life should go, how church should go, our service, our ministry, everything. We have ideas about what it even means to be a Christian. We have ideas. I'm still going to label that pride. But on this line, I'm going to draw an imaginary line. Okay, if this is pride over here, over here at the opposite extreme is humility. Okay? A willingness to say, you know what? I don't know all the answers. I'm willing to consider that I don't have all the answers. That someone else has the answers. And we all know who has the answers. It's the Lord, right? But there's two types of humility. While we're on this side of the spectrum, I want to talk about two types of humility. Because there is a humility of thought and a humility of action. And I didn't find anybody who's teaching this. I didn't see another sermon about this. As I go through the scriptures, I see two major themes. And they fall in this category, one or the other. Humility of thought or mind and then humility of action. And we're going to use Philippians chapter 2 to describe this. And this is going to actually be our main text today. So flip over to Philippians chapter 2. For those of you know, who use your physical Bible, it's on the far right-hand side. Philippians, Colossians. Right before all the Thessalonians. Starting in verse 1, so, it says, So, this is Paul talking to the Philippians. It says, So, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from His love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humilities and humility count others more significant than yourselves. And we start off with an if statement. If there's any encouragement in Christ, is that you? You have any encouragement in Christ? Man, y'all are timid. Yes? Yes, yes. all right. Uh, how about comfort from his love? Yes. Yes. All right, participation in the Spirit. Any affection and sympathy? Yes. 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 Y'all are still timid. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Guys, if, this, if you say yes, if there's affection and sympathy that comes in Christ, your participation in the Spirit, he's talking to you. Okay? So if that's you, listen up. This is what he says. If so, he says, complete my joy by being of the same Mind, having the same love, being in, in full accord, and of one mind. He says mind twice in that verse. Same mind, one mind. Okay? This is the, uh, the thought side of humility that I was trying to decide, to talk about earlier, is the fact that we share not only a common mind and thought, but a common purpose, a common mentality, that we worship our King, our Lord, our Savior, for those of us who are in Christ, who share if, you know, who fulfill that if statement that we're talking about. This is us. And we are united in our mind, in our process, in our purpose, in our thoughts. And because we are united, he says this in this last part of verse 3. He says, in humility, there's that humble word, humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Man, that sounds really close to Romans chapter 12, and I'll read that for you. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with so sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So in other words, in Romans, Paul says, don't think of yourself better than anyone else. I mean, you're not better than Kayla. Kayla, you're not better than Emily. I don't know why I'm talking on the right. Emily, you're not better than Brian. Brian, you're not better than Abigail. But in, in Philippians, he says something even more. Not only are you not better than everyone else in this room, 
But it says, consider everyone to be more significant than yourself. Okay, now spin that. This is even more, right? So now, now Anita, Kayla is more significant than you. Kayla, Emily's more significant than you, and on and on and on. I don't want to belabor the point, but this is an idea of humility. When you are humble like this, this is uh, when you're united like this, when you are of one mind, it results in this kind of thinking, all right? And if you don't thinking like this, it might be that you're not of one mind. It might be that you're, the if statements don't apply to you that we were just talking about. Okay? But if this does apply to you, you are of one mind, and you consider each one more and more important, more significant than yourself. But the great thing is that when you have this thought, this type of humility of thought, it results in action. It doesn't just stay in the mind. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay, now we got another level. Okay, not only is she more significant than you, and you're more significant than her, and on and on and on, but now we have to take care of one another. We meet each other's needs. We serve one another. We help one another. We pick up the brother or sister who's struggling. Whether that be spiritual, whether that be emotional, whether that be financial. We serve one another and we love one another and we help one another. We let this thought come to a complete action. We don't just say, you know, James also talks about that. You don't just wish somebody, well, hope it goes well, good luck and leave them there, but we actually participate. We actually let our beliefs come into, and our faith come into action. And then verse 5 and 6 of Philippians 2 starts talking about Christ, the ultimate example of our humility, the one that we look to. And notice that he first points to the mind again. Okay, here's a theme, thought and action. I want to really drive home that there is a major theme of thought and action here. Verses 5 and 6. Have this mind among yourselves, okay, this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Even Jesus humbled himself. And we know that, right? But look how it is even in mind. He says, Paul says, look, even though he was by nature God, even though he was divine, he did not consider this something to be grasped. That word grasped, sometimes we say it's to be understood. That's not what he meant. He said to be taken hold of. He didn't say, I didn't. He, Jesus did not stand up and take his proper place, but he allowed himself to be humbled in thought and operate according to the will of the Father. Verses 7 and 8. Not only did he not grasp it, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. Here it is again. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Now, guys, we confess we are disciples of Christ, right? We're followers of Christ. He's our example. We preach it almost every Sunday. We look to him on how to live, how we work, how we breathe, how we move, how we minister, how we serve. Fill in the blank. If you want to know, we looked to Jesus. Remember the bracelets that were around what, WWJD? What would you do? <laughs> well, what would you do? What would Jesus do? We look to him because he is our answer. He is our example. So if that's true, and we follow, and we are his disciples, that means, are you humble? All right. Now we're a whole new level. Are you humble? I'm watching for somebody to go, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. Are you humble? And the question is, how do you know? Because, guys, I've got to tell you, pride is something that is invisible to you. You can't see your pride. 
pride is hidden from your eyes. You can see pride in other people's eye, in lives, but you can't see pride in your own lives. Right now, I would guess that the most prideful man in the whole wide world would be thinking, he is pretty awesome. <laughs> like, it's true. He's like, I got it all figured out because it's all about me. But you know what? Good test for pride is to see is it wounded easily? When God's words are spoken into your life, are you wounded? Are you offended? Do you feel the need to defend and justify? I can give you an example. Are you saved? A lot of people say, some people say yes. Some people say yes. Are you saved? I will tell you that there are people that live, and most likely in this room, that confess to say, I'm saved. How do you know that you're saved? Because I said, uh, I, I welcomed Jesus into my heart. I said the prayer. The pastor told me I was saved. Guys, unless you measure yourself against Scripture, you're fatally mistaken. I've got a newsflash for you. Accepting Jesus into your heart is not in scriptures. Unless you are willing to go back and study and say, and this is the act of humility, okay? Because the person that says, I'm saved without being willing to go back and look at scriptures, is a, it's just like Naaman saying, I know how it works. I've got this figured out. And you know what? By my rules and my laws and my understanding, I got it. I figured it out. But it's the humble person that's willing to say, you know what? I need to go back to the scriptures. Is a, there's a possibility that I may have been told wrong. There may be a possibility that I don't understand correctly. I need to go back and look at the scriptures myself instead of just trusting what my pastor told me. And some of you, instead of just trusting what my parents told me. Of course I'm a Christian. I've been in the church since I was little. I grew up in the church. That does not make you a Christian. Go back and read. Look for yourselves. Measure yourself, not by yourself, but by the example of given in Scripture. Then the truth will be shown. Do you have sin in your life? Another thing that re reveals pride. Some of, you will be, some of you readily admit, you know, I confess, I, man, I struggle with these things. I hate sin in my life. But I will also tell you that there have been times of my life that there are portions of my life that I section off and I wall off and I say, this thing right here, this is just part of who I am. And I defend it. And if you attack this thing, it gets too close in my heart, and it hurts me, and I'm offended. And I say, who do you think you are? Do you think you're without sin? <laughs> right? Anybody else with me on that? We defend our sin because we make room for it. The only way we make room for it is because we say, you know what? I know what God's holy requirements are. How do I know? Because I'm naming. It's my way. Right? I know what God's requirements are. But unless you're willing to humble yourself and come to this side and say, you know what? Guys, i got to look at Scripture. i got to see what God's requirements are. What does it look like to surrender sin? What righteous requirement is required by God? I lived many years unwilling, knowing about the scriptures, but unwilling to measure my life against the scriptures. I was not willing to humble myself. What does your life look like in your ministry work? For those who confess to be Christian, who come here day, Sunday after Sunday, and you say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm here. Does your life measure up to the scriptures? I went 25 years as a, 
Christian who was willing to go by my own understanding. I was willing to go by what I was taught. By what did my youth minister say? Yeah, that's good enough for me. I'll run with that. What did my church teach me? Yeah, close enough. I'll, tr- I'll go with that. 25 years into my life, I realized that the fruit of my life was not matching up to Scripture. I could no longer avoid the truths of Scripture. When it says, Scripture, my disciples will do these things, I began to have a crisis of belief, I think is what Candy called it from the uh, Experience in God study. It was a crisis of belief. Because when I look at what scripture says and I look at how I'm living and what's happening in my life, I realize that the two don't match and I got a problem. And either the scriptures are true and these things are really attainable and God has called us to do these things or he's a liar and I'm right. Yeah, it's it's funny, right? But we live that way. I lived 25 years that way. I knew the scriptures. Don't get me wrong. It's not that anyone had ever told me about it. I knew what the scriptures said. I had never lived according to it. I never measured my life. At some point, I had to humble myself. And as I look at the life of Jesus, as I look at what he did for us, the life that he lived. If anybody is due glory and honor and praise, if anybody is due worship, if anyone has a right to say, no, I deserve respect, change the way you're treating, if that's anybody, it's the Lord Jesus. But he did not live according. He humbled himself because it was a purpose. He gave his life for you and me. Jesus, the one through, through whom, whom through all creation was made, through, where everything has its being, through Jesus, allowed himself to be spat upon and mocked. Man, if I were Jesus and you mocked me, so help me, you would have been, I would have pulled a Thanos on you. Just <laughs> done. Half, some people in this room are going, what is he talking about? <laughs> Jesus is the measure of humility. Look to Jesus. Look at his humility. Look at how he lived. Look at how he died. And look at what he did for us. And we say, that is the mark. That is the measure of humility. Or we say, well, Chad, if that's the definition of humility, then we're all lacking. We've all failed. And I say, yes, you got it. You're right. We've all failed. We all have to go through this process of humbling ourselves and humbling ourselves and humbling ourselves. And when I think I've made it, God opens my eyes and I go, oh, man, there's so much more to repent of and so much more to humble myself. So much more. But you know what? As we're faithful to do this little path from pride to humility, well, I have a confidence that I'm never going to be there until I lay down this flesh. But you know what? This process is a sanctifying process. It's a process of growth. It's a process of being matured in Christ. It's a process of bearing fruit in his kingdom and obtaining for the very first time some of the things that I saw in Scripture that I did not think were obtainable to be done in me and through me. I want to ask you a question. I want you to consider something. As you look at your life, where you're at, I want to ask yourself, is it possible that God has a drastically different and better plan for your life than what you're currently living right now? Ask God for humility and just ask you, I ask you, I genuinely ask you, is it possible that God has something drastically better? Not a little bit. I'm talking drastically more powerful, drastically more consistent with the example of, this, of the disciples in Scripture. 
Okay? You look to Jesus and you make excuses and say, well, that's Jesus. I've done that too. I still do that too. <laughs> but look at his disciples. Look what the disciples did. Well, that's different, Chad. They have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> do we not have the Holy Spirit? Yes. Consider for just a moment, would the Lord want to take your life? And use it to change a city, to change a nation. Because I tell you that if you've already decided that the answer is no, you sound like Naaman. Because God's promise is to take people like you and me, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to go and to preach and to teach. Would it be in your future to preach? Would it be in your f future to teach? Would it be your future to make disciples, to bear fruit in his kingdom? Is that according to his will? Yes, over and over. Well, God hasn't told me to. Has he not told you to go and make disciples? And here we go and start making excuses. Guys, I can't help but think of Moses. You remember when God met with Moses? And at one point, Moses says, oh, God, just send somebody else. I hear you. You have a plan for me. You want me to go here? You want me to speak to Pharaoh? You want me to set your people free? Send somebody else. And what happened in that moment? Do you remember what happened? God's anger burned against Moses. And we're like, stupid Moses, you should have listened. <laughs> And here we are in the same exact place, looking Jesus right in the eyes through Scripture. He says, go and make disciples. And we go, God, this is somebody else. I wonder if God's anger does not burn against us. When we say, I would rather let those people die and go to hell than become uncomfortable. It's a hard truth but one worth asking. Part of my personal story is this over and over. Coming to NACC, saying, God, I don't see, I don't see this to be true in my life. God, is there, is there something I'm missing? Is there another way other than what I've been taught and what I've been doing? Because I see the fruit of my life. Is there another way? Six months later, we end up walking in the doors here at NACC. Found out there's a lot more to my faith. Found out there's a lot more that can be had than what I was experiencing, what I was doing, what I was living. Get invited to become, oh, well, get invited to preach. I've told you that many times. Walked in the door saying, I can't preach, I can't teach, I can't talk, don't ask. What, what Naaman-ish attitudes? <laughs> what misunderstanding of who God is and what God does? Rick invites me to be a pastor of this church. I said, I can't be a pastor. I'm just a people. I'm just one of these pew people. I can't be up here. I got no education. I've never been to seminary. I don't, have, I don't have one, I don't know if this is going to shock anybody, but I have not one college level course of Bible training. What qualifies me to be a pastor other than God's calling on my life? We limit God by our lack of willingness to just consider could God want you to be a pastor. Would God want to use you to go out on the streets and convert and share the kingdom and grow? It's a humbling thought, but one, it's a thought that we've closed our eyes to so many times. You should have seen me wrestle with the one, does God want me to be a missionary? Really, God? 
God, I got so many th- good things going at NACC. I got this discipleship thing going with Rick, and I'm growing, and I'm learning, and I've got so much more to learn, God. How can I leave here? Oh, yes, Lord. I'm open to the fact that you have something more for me outside of this church. Because really, guys, there's only two options. There is either humble yourself and make yourself down this path of pride and a willingness to think that there's something else to be obtained. Work yourself way down and humble yourself or to be humbled. Well, it's not really an option if you think about it. So the only person that's willing to be humbled is the pride man that's blind to it in the first place. Matthew 23, verse 12. This is the words of Jesus. It says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You lift yourself up, he will knock you down. That's a, you know, God keeps his promises, right? You know that, right? That's not a promise that I want to see kept in me, that God will humble the proud. God will humble the one that exalts himself. That's not, a, that's not a, a promise I want to call God on. Say, okay, God, let's see what you got. I do not want to be on that. I want to be the one that humbles myself over and over. James chapter 4, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He will not ignore you. He will not give you a pass. He will stand in your way and block you. And some people are here in this room right now going, I feel blocked. I feel obstructed. I can't move forward. Something's happening in my life. Is it possible that it's pride? A, pride, a proud man would say no. <laughs> Just saying. James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Exalt you. There is nothing more beautiful than being lifted up by the Lord. To be exalted by God. And ultimately, guys, where this is all headed is to be glorified by God. To participate with Christ in his death and then participate with him in his resurrection. I can't think of a more beautiful way to be exalted and lifted up in Christ. But he says that he will oppose those who are not. That is not a place that I want to be. Now, I want to share something with you. And this is for, I've known many of you for many years. Many of you, I know the fruit of your life. I know that you love the Lord. I know that you love the Lord. I see it in you. And I want to encourage you with some of these things. Um, You know, I hid behind humility for a long time as a cheap excuse to not do the things that I that I felt like God was calling me to do. Um, you know, one of those things was preaching and teaching, and I thought, you know, I'm just a, I told you, I'm just a people. It's not my place. It's not my place to be a pastor. But as I look more into Scripture and I look at what the disciples are doing, And I'm more willing to take my life. And I get down the scale and I say, well, God, please break through my pride. Help me to see, is this my life? I'm looking at the example of the disciples. I'm looking at how they lived, looking at what they did. I'm saying, is this me? I still come with a resounding no. And I've hidden behind, does God want me to participate? I shouldn't move around. I guess I'm on YouTube. There we go. Does God want me to participate in the miraculous? Does God want me to participate in healings? Does God want me to, deliv- uh, to participate in deliverance? Because you know what? I, had a, I was okay saying, yeah, I'll stand up and I'll preach and I'll teach. You know, if you practice enough and you prepare enough, you can feel comfortable standing up here. 
there's very little that will help you to feel comfortable praying healing over people <laughs> and doing deliverance ministry. It takes raw obedience. And I will tell you, for years, I hid behind the excuse, I'm just a people. I'm just a people. But you know what? God uses people. Is it possible for those of you that belong to the Lord, is it possible that he wants to use you in miraculous ways? Is it possible that he wants to use you to heal, to deliver? It's a crazy thought, right? Especially if you grew up in a church heritage that did not teach this. But I will tell you, I've been slow to come along this bus and this train. This train moves real slowly over here, okay? I'm slow to believe. I will be the first to admit it. But we're in Latvia. And I've, guys, I've seen Rick pray over people. I've seen people be healed. I've seen deliverance. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen. How many of us have seen it? There's no doubt God heals. There's no, God, uh, no doubt that God delivers. We've seen it over and over. That's not the news. But I get in Latvia, and Jovita, you remember, y'all met Jovita from Lithuania. Jovita comes to me, and she says, Chad, I've got to tell you, I wake up every day crying. She's like, I'm just so down. I can't even get out of bed, so I just want to sleep. I'm like, that's depression. I don't know if y'all know this, but Jovita is a child psychiatrist. <laughs> it seems ironic for me to tell a psychiatrist that she has depression, but anyway. <laughs> She has access to all medication. She can write something for herself. Had this been in here in Austin, I would be like, Rick, aisle one. We got a need. I look around, there's no Rick. There's just me. I say, okay, Lord. I got nothing but you. So I put hands over her. And I pray the way that I saw Rick do time and time again. And I rebuke that spirit of depression. I tell it to leave. And I tell it to leave firmly. I know timidly. I'm like, I don't know why. I just rose up. And that wasn't me rising up. It was the spirit of God. Holy Spirit rising up in me. And I'm telling it to leave. And I let go of her at the end. I'm like, you know, trying not to do the, <laughs> trying not to do the, the thing. Like, yeah, to work. <laughs> but uh, she went on she had a flight to catch that day we, visited, we caught up months later she said Chad I stopped crying I stopped laying in bed I stopped being depressed yeah and I'm trying to I'm trying to hide the the really <laughs> he did I tried to be all like yeah of course that's what the Lord does <laughs> Even then, the pride. <laughs> I told you, I got pride. I got lots of pride. A, f- a few months ago, my employee calls me over the phone. She says, I can't move my neck up, down, left, right. But I'm able to sit here before you and, and do my work. So I'm here. I, just don't, I can't look down. And I hear the Lord say, pray for her. And I actually argued with the Lord. No, we're not right now. We're on a business call. It, that would be awkward. <laughs> so I go on, and I can hear her struggling in. I hear, pray for her. Oh, okay, 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 at the end. No, I don't usually impl- pray over my employees. But at the end, I said, Kara, I, I got I to gotta tell you, I want to pray over the phone, over your neck. And I began praying over her. And I tell that neck to let go, loosen up, whatever. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And I can hear her start breathing real deeply. Sounds like she's choking back tears. She says, Chad, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, try me. (laughs) She's like, but I'm moving my head left, right, up, down without a little bit of pain. I'm like, really? (laughs) You think I would learn? A couple of days ago, a week ago, so the Worths were here. 
and I knew that they were really struggling with sickness. They did not feel good. And I put my hands on John and Hyacinth and prayed over them, rebuked sickness. Found out later, John was telling, saying, completely lifted off of him. All symptoms felt completely better. I hope that's true. He's going to be watching this. Well, yeah, but my understanding is he, that in that moment, everything was better. Really? <laughs> Would God really want to use us? It takes an act of humility to even consider it. But I will tell you the answer is yes. He has always wanted to use us. And he has always used people like you and me. You know, we deal with sin in our lives and we think we're disqualified. You're like, no, God, I messed up. You can't use me. I'm disqualified. I got to go sit on the bench. <laughs> That's not how the Lord works. He uses broken people. People who are fighting and repenting and coming back to him. And you can participate in the miraculous. It's been an amazing story for me. I'm still not where I need to be. As we go back to Latvia, my goal is to put my hands on more people and pray, to pray with boldness, to pray with faith, Amen. to pray to the point where when someone says, I was healed, to where I'm not like, really? I'd like to, to genuinely go, I know, isn't it great? This is what the Lord does, and he can do it through you. That's where I'm going. I feel it. I feel it. I just want you to go with me. Not to Latvia. <laughs> but I want you here. I want to, when I call Rick and I say, what's going on at NACC? I want him to tell me, well, God, Candy just did this. All, and then Emily laid her hands. And boy, you wouldn't believe what Lilia did. And boy, Veronica and Marina, you will not believe. Darian, you can't stop him from going out daily, casting out demons and healing the sick. This is my hope for you. And not as in my hope. This is the Lord's hope for you. This is what he does. Have faith. Believe it. There's more for you. So much more. I don't know what's next for you, but God is willing and able to reveal himself more. Teens that came with Abby... I don't know if you, I call you the gaggle, a gaggle of teens. <laughs> what? Like, what? Yeah, like, like, what? A gaggle. A group. Like, I think it's a, maybe it's an old man term. I don't know. <laughs> There's so much that you are discovering and that you're seeing. There's more. You want to know what your next step is? Come Monday night prayer night and see even more. You've seen the excitement. You've seen the celebration. Come encounter prayer with the Spanish church and the English church combined. You will see that there's more of God to be had, and it is a beautiful thing. Who do we have to play guitar? Who do I have? Oh, there's Natalie. Thank you. We're going to do an invitation. And it's a, a, an invitation just to consider. Humble yourselves and ask, God, what would you have for me? God, I've sat on the sidelines long enough thinking that I was disqualified. I've spent too long thinking like Naaman, thinking that I know how this is supposed to work. I go to church, I sit down, I put some money in the box on the way out, and I've done my job. So, Naaman, the Lord has a different way for you. I pray that you find it. Go ahead. Father God, bow your heads. Here's that silence that Rick talked about. What's the Lord telling you right now? Are you good in your own eyes? Some of you call yourself Christian and you've never compared your life to Scripture. Does anybody want to acknowledge that to be true in your life? 
stand up, make a confession, make a, a movement toward the Lord and say, you know what? I may not know what scripture says, but I'm willing to find out. I'm willing to be a disciple. I'm willing to be taught. I'm willing to ask the hard questions. Is that you? If so, stand up. broaden the invitation just a little bit more. I'm going to say, do you have sin that you've defended in your life? And you say, this is my sin, it's me, don't mess with it. But God is telling you, you've got to let it go. This is not of me. You need to confess it and let it go. And I'm not talking about guys and things that you have repented over and over again. I'm not asking for you to do that again. Is there a part of your life that you've never surrendered to the Lord? If so, stand up. This is what it looks like to humble yourself. To stand up and say, I need the help of God. I don't have it figured out on my own. But I know there's a God that loves me and will watch over me and shepherd my heart and lead me forward in paths of repentance and paths of restoration and paths of life. This is what it looks like. It's the proud man that gets left behind. It's the proud man that dies slowly. It's the proud man that is content to live a dead life day after day, week after week. And say, this is okay. That's name and thinking. Don't ever be embarrassed to stand up and say, I'm failing. I'm so proud of you to stand up and have stood up. Father God, I pray for those who are standing right now. Lord Jesus, I pray by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you come and just fall on them right now and you give life and you give help and you restore and you redeem and you break down walls, Lord. Tear down the flesh, the, the stony parts of our lives, God, and make us back in your image, God. Tear down the pride right now, Lord Jesus. Help us to be like you, God. We do not want to die. We do not want to stay where we were. We do not want to live so far from you and live lives that do not look like Scripture. Give us a willingness to analyze and look at ourselves according to Scripture, according to the example of Jesus. Lord, do a miracle work in us that only you can do in us right now. We surrender. We don't have it. It is only you that can do a new work in us. We're tired of trying. Come wash over us, God. For those who are standing, God, I pray for a new stirring in their spirit. I pray, Father, that you give them a fire, Lord, that they have never had, a hunger to search for you, God. I pray, Father, that you stir in them in such a powerful way that they cannot sit still and they cannot keep it to themselves anymore. But they must pursue you with everything they have. And they must love you with everything that they have. Lord, do not leave us alone to die. And we know, Lord, that you pursue us and that you do pursue us. You have never let us go for those who belong to us. And I know that there are some of your children who are standing right now. You've never given up on them. You have always had them. They have never been outside of your sight. And this is just more of your work going forward today, God. Lord, we repent. We repent of our broken. We repent of our lust. We repent of our pride. We repent of our hate. We repent of our unforgiveness. Forgive us, God, for so many more things than that. God, we hold on to hurt and we defend it. You call it unforgiveness. We surrender even that right now. 
soften our hearts toward you, Lord. Lord, we give you praise for who you are, for what you've done, what you continue to do. Lord, I pray, Father, that this response right now does not end today, God. May it not just be an amen, go home and eat. But Lord, may we respond. May we not just be humble in thought. Lord, we're there and some of us are there in thought today. Humbling ourselves in thought. Lord, may this move into action. May our feet, the steps moving forward be changed, Lord, to pursue you differently in a new way. I pray our young people show up at Spanish church or Spanish prayer night, Monday night. I pray all of you show up at prayer night. It's good for all of you. Lord, we love you. You are our king. You are our God. And without you, there's no Help us to empty ourselves out. We love you. I'm going to let y'all continue to pray. Don't be afraid of silence. Just spend some time with the Lord.